Hey everyone, so we've got an exciting guest for you here today. It's Dr. Ritu Chopra, uh, board certified plastic surgeon here in Beverly Hills, probably one of the top plastic surgeons in Beverly Hills. Um, you are a clinical faculty, um, uh, you're a clinical faculty at USC. Um, you're a, a regular correspondent on the doctor's TV show. Um, you have an incredible amount of uh, credentials in terms of uh, working uh, here in Beverly Hills, but also with Pink Lotus Breast, Can uh, Breast Cancer Center, as well as um, director of um, some other medical facilities. Um, your your training is is uh, is in impeccable. General surgery, plastic surgery. Um, I'm really excited to have you on to to talk about uh, some of the stuff we want to talk about today. So thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Dan. You know, I've been looking really forward to this. I see you a lot when we operate together and we talk about a lot of things about plastic surgery. And this is a great sort of forum where we can get great information out. Yeah, absolutely. So Dr. Chopra actually operates here at Ivy Surgical Center. So we share some of the same operating rooms, uh, you know, obviously different times. And so we, we've, um, I, I really, I, I've seen the amount of surgeries that you've been doing. You're extremely busy dedicated, talented plastic surgeon. You're doing a lot of surgeries right now um, in terms of explant surgeries. Yes. And that's a big topic that's going on right now. And I love to kind of dive into that and 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 see what's going on, what's driving this, um, what's driving this, uh, this want or this need to, for people to remove their implants. Right. I think it's twofold. Like, um, I'm sure a lot of your listeners know, one, because the textured implants have been recalled by Allergan. Okay. So that's, one big topic in itself. So tell me about that. What, what's, what is a textured implant? So there's two types of implants, as we know. There's smooth texture where there's no nothing on top of the implant. It's completely smooth versus textured. Mm -hmm. The textured in back in the day was thought to prevent capsular contracture. We found out that that is not necessarily the truth. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten away from using that. However, the shaped implants, we use texture because they wouldn't rotate is right. actually having like sandpaper on the bottom of it. Okay. That's Maybe essentially like a, the texturing. Like a Velcro almost. That's exactly right. Yeah. And even that didn't prevent them from rotating. They still get a rotation percent, two to seven percent of these implants are still rotating. Okay. So these are implants that are shaped like a teardrop or like, you know, not completely round. Exactly. That's okay. exactly right. And we used to start using them with reconstruction. Okay. When patients had no upper pole fullness, that would give them that. Mm -hmm. The issue is completely separate now. The issue is that these implants have been associated with breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Okay. It's very, very rare. That's a mouthful. Hold on. Let's back that up. So breast, so B, B I A A L C L breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. This is not breast cancer, right? Absolutely right. Okay. It's a T cell lymphoma. Okay. Nothing to do with your breast. It has to do with your capsule. Okay. Have you seen this? I have not seen this in my patients. Uh -huh. I have diagnosed one that went somewhere else, but I have taken out several textured implants and sent the capsule for a specific immunostain mm -hmm. called CD30. Okay. That CD30 can pick up your ALCL. Now, is this is this like should we should we ring the alarm bells? Like, what's you know this is you know we thought everybody thought implants were safe. What's what's the lowdown on this? So that's very an interesting question, and I think yeah. it's objective and also subjective. Mm -hmm. We know the smooth implants are safe. Okay, they've never been associated with ALCL or anything. So we know smooth implants are safe. Mm -hmm. The question now becomes, what do you do with the people who have textured implants in? Yeah. So what is the rate of getting ALCL from textured implants? And that's anywhere between 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 3,000. So it's very rare. So the 1 in 1,000, that's for polyurethane-coated implants, that's right? Because, right. you know, I, I, I've been doing a lot of research on this, and, and I don't do as many explants as you do, and that's why I'm glad to, to have you on. So what is a polyurethane-coated implant? Do, is that a particular company, or is that overseas, or is that in the United States? Yeah, so those are older implants that used ah. to have polyurethane in them. Okay, so they don't make those anymore. That's right. Okay, so if someone has a polyurethane implant, coated implant, should they get those removed? <laughs> so that's a, such a dicey subject. So I'm yeah. going to sort of... Because if they're old, right, they shouldn't, shouldn't they... I mean, implants, I, I tell my patients every 10 years, you should probably get them exchanged. I right? think that's right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so polyurethane implants, are they older than 10 years now? Or? Yes. Okay, so these people should probably think about getting them removed, not for the lymphoma risk, but just, hey, you know... 
this might be a good idea to get them exchanged. Yeah, and so when do people develop this lymphoma, right? It's yeah. usually between seven to 10 years. Okay. So these implants have to be in long enough for them to actually generate the, this, this disease. We're right. not sure why they're developing it. Two hypotheses. One, low-grade inflammation to the silicone for some reason. Mm -hmm. It's chronic inflammation causing a change, antioxidants causing a change in MR. NA, right, causing a yeah. change in sort of your so body. So mRNA, so uh, messenger RNA, so that's the cell signaling that's going on in these cells Absolutely. that are exposed to this textured implant. Right, the chronic okay. inflammation. And the second yeah. could be a biofilm. They've done good studies on capsules on patients who don't have ALCL and do have ACL. These have complete distinct different morphology. Mm -hmm. Most of the ones without ALCL have staph. Most of the ones with have a bacteria called Ralstoni. Interesting. I've never heard of that. So, yeah, so they're distinctly different species. Yeah. However, you can treat this bacteria by coating or bathing your textured implant in betadine. Interesting. Do you do that? I don't put textured in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually still, so um, I still use textured. Um, I use them in very isolated circumstances, yeah. um, and I fully inform all my patients that do get the texture. I, I actually use a, a brand of the textured implants that's not associated with the recall. Um, their current uh, association with an, uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma is 1 in 86,000. Right. So your chances of getting struck by lightning in your lifetime is about one in 3000. So I kind of, you know, I kind of have to break down these statistics for people. Um, I do, ha I do notice some advantages when I do textured implants for dramatic lifts or for very difficult revisions where I need just a little more stability with the implant. Now I give them that choice. I, I can say, look, I'm, I can, I can get you a better result with this textured implant. We, we kind of roll the dice more if we do a smooth in those very rare particular situations. Um, but I actually do coat it with betadine and triple antibiotic solution when so, I do that. So I think that's smart. And I think the most important thing that you said is informed consent. If you give these patients informed consent, they can make their decision, an educated decision. Yeah. It's the ones that you aren't giving them informed consent. Right. Great. So, um, so, so again, so what, what, what should somebody do if they, they have these, if they have a text, so let's say it's not polyurethane. Let's say right. it's, you know, one of these typical brands these in the past few years that they actually have a texture implant. What, what should they do? So what are the symptoms, right? What are the mm -hmm. symptoms that someone needs to be worried about? It's generally swelling. Okay. So someone will come into your office, say, you know, a doc, my breast just started swelling. Mm -hmm. So it's likely fluid. That fluid needs to be tested. Okay, so you, this is like one side. We're not talking like a couple of weeks out after surgery. We're talking how far out? That's right, at least a year out. Okay. At least a year out when you know you're healed completely. Mm -hmm. Patients come in and say, Doc, I have unilateral swelling or bilateral swelling. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. You test that fluid. You need at least 50 cc's. Okay. And you send that for the same stain, CD30, mm -hmm. and you see what comes back. Okay. That's one of the main symptoms as well as there can be cutaneous manifestations because it is a T-cell lymphoma. They can have some weird, strange rashes that mm -hmm. you're not sure where they come from. You can actually scrape those and send those for CD32. Okay. So if you were to drain, would you ever drain just the fluid by itself and not do the surgery to remove? Absolutely. Okay. So you can drain that fluid. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't come back positive for CD30, well, then you're okay. Okay. Um, now what if it does come back positive? So what do you do when it comes back positive? That's a great question. You got to get a PET scan first mm -hmm. to make sure that there's no spread. Once you do that, the treatment is what we essentially do anyways. Take the implant out and do a total capsulectomy. Okay. Um, so a PET scan is basically, it's not a CT scan. It's like a magnetic resonance where it's checking for spread of, uh, these particular types of cells. Absolutely right. Okay. Um, that's, that's very interesting. Um, you know, I know some of the statistics, um, as of June of 2018, uh, there was 560 confirmed cases of, uh, breast implant associated ALCL and of that only 16 deaths. Right. Yeah. I think that's number has gone up a little bit okay. to about 30 deaths. 30 deaths. Okay. Yeah. This yeah. is, this is an older statistic. That's June of 2018. So that's like last yeah. year. Um, so that's, so it's gone up to 30 okay. around then. Yeah. I'm pretty sure around there. What's interesting though, is that I'm sure you know that one case of ALCL has been shown with butt implants that are textured. Interesting. I didn't know that actually. Yeah, buttock implant, one buttock implant that has been textured yeah. has been now associated with ALCL. Wow. 
So do you do buttock implants? I do not. Okay. <laughs> I don't either. I do fat transfer. Yes. Um, but I, I don't use the implants. They're kind of, it's kind of a dicey area. I agree. High rate of infection, yeah. pain, all the above. Yeah. So I try to stay away from those, but this just shows that, that it's not necessarily because of the breast. Mm. It's the implant and the chronic inflammation. Yeah. That something's going on. So um, it's interesting. The, the disease progression of, of this, of this um, rare lymphoma, it doesn't happen right away. What's a typical onset? Do we have enough data to know when this would typically present when someone gets detected? Yeah, so, I mean, generally it's an 8 to 10 year period. Mm -hmm. So women who have an in for 8 to 10 years, like you were saying, should probably get them changed anyways. Yeah. But that's sort of the sweet spot of where you can sort of develop these symptoms. Okay. And it's interesting that there's been a lot of confirmed cases and a lot of women have just had the implants removed, capsulectomies, and is that the definitive treatment? Is there any other thing, anything else that needs to be done at that point if there's no spread? Yes. Yeah, so if there's no spread, a total capsulectomy, you need to get all the capsule out. Yeah. That's the most important thing. Okay. And then obviously send it for CD30. If that's positive and the PET scan's negative, mm -hmm. there's no further treatment. And the survival... 10 year, I think five year survival is between 85 and 95%. It's very, very high. Okay. If they're spread, you probably have to do chemo first. Oh, wow. Yeah. So okay. you do chemo first, get the chemo done, take the implants out, take the capsules out. Got it. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, this is, it's, it's alarming because, you know, back when implants started, you know, the, there was all kinds of concerns about breast cancer and the FDA did a lot of tests and they were, you know, breast implants are safe and this has kind of been a new thing. And it's kind of, you know, I feel like I, I tell my patients this a lot. A lot of people try to demonize breast implants because of you should be happy with how your body looks right. and we're plastic surgeons. You know, we know people want to do things to make them feel better, yep. you know, and as long as it's safe and reasonable. And so I feel like people have always been trying to demonize implants. And with this information, I feel like people are making broad assumptions about all implants. Is this, is this, I mean, does this apply to all implants or is it just? Absolutely not. Okay. I think we know Allergan took these off the market voluntarily. Okay. So the FDA didn't tell them to do it. They took them off voluntarily because of the data. Okay. Now, Allergan is, is this the one company that uses the biocell implants? Yeah. Is so correct? macro texturing. Okay. Macro texturing. To micro texturing, which Mentor and Cientra use. Okay. So the, the recall applies to women who have had Allergan biocell implants. As well as tissue expanders. Okay. So some... So that'd be rare for some one woman to have just a tissue expander left in there. I actually have heard of some women that just... they. They don't feel like coming back and get their expander out yep. for a permanent implant. So that's that's actually interesting yeah. information. Um, what's your advice for women out there that are um, that have textured implants right now? What would you suggest? I've been going through this in my mind, the sort of algorithm of what I say. I, I don't mm -hmm. want to cause a hysteria like you don't want to yeah. cause a hysteria. Mm -hmm. So I always try to relate it to my family, right? So if I pose a question to you, if your mom had these textured implants in, yeah. what would you tell her? Uh, I, I would be like, uh, just exchange them in 10 years. Yeah. That's what I would tell. I'd say, you know, uh, get, go see your doc, make sure everything's cool. Yeah. And, um, you know, if there's any problems, any, any of the symptoms that we talked about, skin rashes yeah. or swelling, um, yeah. then, you know, we need to take a closer look. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's pretty rare. It's not like it's, it's, it's 50%, right? Well, that's the thing. It's, yeah. it's very uncommon. And so I, I do the same thing. I do tell people that. Does your mom have breast implants? She doesn't. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just kidding. You might have put them in, huh? No. <laughs> but um, I, 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 do, I do wrestle with this a little bit. Yeah. Because the patients that had these implants in were not given the correct informed consent mm. of telling them that these could possibly cause this rare lymphoma. Yeah. That's the only thing I struggle with. So I feel like... Well, you know, it's 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 not necessarily a fault because we didn't have total totally. information on it, right? So it's not like we were misleading. We went with the risks that we knew at the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And so now we know that their risk exists. It's just like knowing different drugs cause different things. They come out and we think they're great. Yeah. And then a year or two, they're like, oh, you know, they're not that good for you. Hmm. Right. And so what do you do with those patients that have been on it and they have these, perhaps a chronic disease going on? Yeah. Right. So... I think if patients are worried, they should follow up with their doc for sure. And mm -hmm. if they're super worried, get them taken out, get the capsule taken out, and then they can put smooth implants in if they still want smooth implants okay. in. 
What about, is there any other option um, besides putting another implant in? I think there's several options. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about reconstructive patients yeah. because they have a lot of textured implants. So a reconstructive patients is like a woman has had breast cancer or has had mastectomy. Okay. Yes. So those patients who have no breast tissue mm -hmm. and have textured implants in, I think taking them out and either doing a deep flap, tram mm -hmm. flap, Something like that. So like taking abdominal tissue basically and Recon making a breast out of it. Yeah. I think okay. that's a great option for those patients. Great. Um, and I know the microsurgeons at UCLA are going to be happy with that. Yeah. So <laughs> They're quite busy over there. Yes. Yeah. So I think that's a great option for them. I do think fat transfer, if they have enough breast tissue, mm -hmm. taking the implants out and doing serial fat grafting. Yeah. Because it's tough. It, fat, you know, it's like wh where we have that predictability of an implant, we know it's going to see the same volume. Fat, is, it's got a mind of its own. You know, Absolutely. and I tell my patients all the time, I was like, you know, manage your expectations because sometimes we get great take and then sometimes we're like, hmm, we lost 40% of that graft, you know. And right. So I tell patients that exactly what you said. I said, yeah. most of the time you have to do more than one. Right. And so if they're up for that, I think that's a nice option to get the implants out. Awesome. Anything else you want to you want to chat about with? Because I want to move on to a topic that is less defined. Yes. And I know it's it's it's. Uh, I was actually doing research on this, and I went on several websites, and and your name was popping up left and right as a trusted uh, end block capsulectomy uh, surgeon. But anything else you want to touch on with um, uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma? I think we touched on it, but the main things are it's uncommon. Yep. And make sure you're following up with your surgeon. Okay. And make sure they're board certified. Yeah. You know, so there's some charlatans out there that aren't board certified and will tell you the wrong information. Mm -hmm. All of us have taken an oath to do no harm. Right. And so go to a plastic surgeon that's board certified and they'll take care of you. Yeah. So both of us, both of us are actually board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. That is the certifying body that you want to make sure that your doctor is associated with. Um, that's really key because we actually have a very active society um, that updates us and does active research. They do research on, you know all types of things with implants, independent of what the FDA wants them to do. And so I think we're, we're very proactive with trying to make sure that things that we're doing are safe and that we know all of the information that's pertinent to be able to give informed consent for patients. So um, my hat's off to, uh, to our society for doing that. Absolutely. So, yeah. All right. So let's switch gears. Um, breast implant associated illness. Yes. So breast what implant. What the hell is that? <laughs> well, as you know, I do quite a few of these a week. Yeah. What is it that you do? You do, you do these, you remove these implants yes. and you do what's called an in-block capsulectomy. So let's kind of sort of dispel that myth okay. of the in-block capsulectomy. Okay. Right. So these patients are coming in and they want their implants out because they're feeling that they're causing them illness. We don't know why, but they're reacting to these implants. So we take the implant out and we also take the capsule out because as you know, some of these implants have a low bleed rate, meaning that some of the silicone from the shell will get out into the body. Right. So by taking the capsule out, we get essentially all of that silicone out. What's an M-block capsulectomy? M-block capsulectomy, when we get the implant out along with the whole capsule in one piece. Yeah. As you know, that's very difficult to do when they're under the muscle because of the ribs mm -hmm. and the thinness of the capsule. Yeah. So oftentimes I try to do an M block, but most of the time I'm ending up doing a total capsulectomy, which okay. I take out the implant mm -hmm. and then I have to take out the capsule in pieces, but mm -hmm. I get the ha imp get the capsule out 100%. Um, I routinely do these operations. So typically, I've actually had a few um, come to see me that have complained of breast implant associated illness. They think they have it. They have symptoms like fatigue, hair loss, tired. Um, help me out. What are some uh, joint pain, joint rash, yeah. fibromyalgia, autoimmune, Hashimoto's? Right. Yeah. So there's some, some strange constellation of symptoms. There's not like a, um, there's no test That's that it. I can give these people. I'm like, I don't know if this is going on, but they've already come to me. They're like, I want my implants out. I'm like, all right, you are determined to do this. I am a good surgeon. I'm going to do this for you. And it's, I, I can do, sometimes I get lucky. I can get an unblock. Totally. Um, most of the time I um, get as much as I can. And then I take out the implant and I just get that little last piece on the back wall. That's but exactly um, right. it takes about an hour per side. It's, it's, At least. yeah, it's, it's, um, it's hard work. Yep. I feel like I've done, um, and, and, 
capsulectomies on patients that have had previous ones. And there's like two mm-hmm. or three layers of leftover from some other surgeon who left them in there. And I know that that wasn't done right the first time. Where where those, where I typically, where we traditionally have done this is people that have had capsular contracture. And this yeah. is actually a different entity than breast implant illness. That's when you get that scar tissue that develops around the implant, gets hard, firm. Um, I think Victoria Beckham might have had that. And you can, you can see photos of when she had that. And she, it looks like she's gotten that fix. I, I'm not her doctor. I don't know who it is, but um, that's that example, that characteristic firmness of caps or contracture, which is a real thing. We know it. We can document it. One in 20 incidents of that nationwide with any breast augmentation surgery. Um, that's been the majority of my capsulectomies and they are very, very challenging. But, um, I, and I know this because when I go in there and I'm sweating and I'm getting his back wall and I see the two to three layers that the previous surgeon didn't get, yeah. but it's super important to get all of that. I agree with you hundred percent. And you know how difficult it is scraping out the ribs. There's only a millimeter between you yeah. and the lung. Yeah. Right. So you, right. it is tedious. You got to be careful and you got to be patient. Yeah. So what you were saying, we don't have a test for these patients and that's yeah. absolutely right. So my analogy is someone who has celiac disease, mm-hmm. celiac disease. We know it's gluten problems, right? They have mm-hmm. an antibody to gluten. We know out there there's millions of people who have gluten sensitivity. We give them gluten, they'll have bloating, mm-hmm. they'll have cramping, they'll have all the symptoms. We can't test those people. Yeah. It's very analogous to the people who have breast implant illness. Mm-hmm. We don't have a test for these people who may react to the silicone, or yeah. may react just to a foreign body. Right. We don't have any test for that. All we know is that after years, you may react. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I, I, I've had some patients that, of uh, my own patients, I've, I've done the surgery, um, just a couple, and they've immediately started experiencing certain symptoms and wanted to have their implants out. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's do it. Let's see if it helps you because these symptoms are really affecting them. But it's, it's tough because I sometimes will do this, I'll remove the implants, uh-huh. and then their symptoms don't get better. And it's frustrating because we've just now removed a beautiful implant and now we're we haven't really solved their problems you know so this is a this is a um very challenging um unknown that we're, we're kind of dealing with um but you know it's it's there's other things that happen with surgery too like we give our patients antibiotics you know and um a study recently came out that talked about a, a normal course of antibiotics can alter your gut you have a higher incidence of depression six months after just from the loss of gut biome yep. right so is it other things that we're doing from surgery that's causing some of these symptoms that people might be feeling i'm just wondering you know yeah i think it's going to be multifactorial Mm -hmm. I think implants are just part of it. I think when I'm looking at this disease process of what's going on, there's a low-grade chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. So these patients will react. So you look at their ANA titers for lupus, they'll Mm -hmm. bump. You look Mm -hmm. at some Hashimoto's, it'll bump. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes their C-reactive protein will bump. And we're not sure why, except they have a chronic low-grade inflammation. If this chronic low-grade inflammation goes on for a while, it can cause some vague symptoms. Mm -hmm. As you know, chronic low-grade inflammation anywhere in any cell can cause change in their DNA and RNA. It can lead to cancer. It can lead to inflammation. It can lead to different symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's going on. We just don't have the test for it. And I can tell you, the hundreds of women that I've done... I can put in the confidence interval between 95 and 99%. Most of them feel better. Really? There's outliers who yeah. don't feel better. Mm-hmm. And so is it some of it placebo effect? Sure. Is it some of it we're getting the implants out? And those are the patients who really have some chronic inflammation or just not candidates for implants? Sure. Yeah. So there's sort of the... So con- let's talk about that. So... Are there people that shouldn't be getting implants? Like, you know, if you have lupus, if you have yes. rheumatoid, Absolutely. if you are like an irritable bowel syndrome or, or Hashimoto's, which is um, Hashimoto's is when you get uh, autoimmune attack of the thyroid. Are these people that should think twice about getting implants? I think 100%. Yeah. I think anybody who has an autoimmune disorder yeah. should not get implants in. Okay. And I feel strongly about that. And a lot of people may not agree with me. Yeah. But for my practice, if someone had cousin autoimmune, I, I say I don't put them in. What are you studying these explants that you're doing? Yes. Okay, because I'd love to know how many people that are feeling better after explant had some pre existing autoimmune dysfunction, right? So we don't know that. So mm-hmm. we the patients get these implants in generally and then they get their tests, right? Yeah, 
So we don't know if they had it before or not. Okay. That's sort of the issue. Yeah. Um, wow. But and it's, it's, it's yeah. A, you see, it's, it's a big problem or big issue, not a problem, to tease out the symptoms of what's coming from what. Mm -hmm. Vitamin D deficiency in women can cause a lot of the symptoms of fatigue, yeah. hair loss, mm -hmm. not feeling great, yeah. having three kids, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, all these symptoms are vague. Yeah. But, and I'm just going to put it out there, if I wasn't doing so many of them and seeing so many women get better, yeah. I would be a little bit like, well, really, the implants are making them sick? So, sh yeah. So, I mean, so should should we ban implants? No. So yeah. I don't think that at all. I think okay. for the majority of women, mm -hmm. they can take it, yeah. right? So I have good friends who have implants in forever, yeah, and they're doing wonderfully. Yeah, I've had people that have implants in for six months and are doing horribly. Mm. So right, so there's a huge difference, and we just can't find those patients. Yeah, once we're able to, and I think we are going to be able to, mm -hmm. with all the genomic stuffs going on, we're going to be able to find the people that are sensitive to different things. Yeah, and we'll know. And then, you know, I also wonder if there's a surgical technique component, you know, if there's a low grade inflammation caused by additional contamination that we can somehow prevent with certain surgical techniques, that would be great. You know, I just, I just wish we had more of this information. But I tell you, um, Dr. Chopra, like when, when I've got my patients, they're six weeks out from their breast augmentation and how happy they are. You know, this is something they've been like self-conscious about. They've never had breasts. They don't, they can't fit into, I, I, I'm like, I tell people, look, we can fight societal norms about what breast proportion should be in the, and, and the rest of the female body, or you can get breast implants and feel good about your body. And, and that's a total personal choice. And I don't push it on anybody. But when I see these women, they come in after breast augmentation, they're so happy. You know? Well, I've, I've seen your work and you, you do beautiful work. I mm -hmm. think the key is, like we talked about, is the informed consent. Yeah. If you can tell the patients, hey, listen, there's a small chance that you might be one of the patients that react to these implants. We might take them out. If you're okay with that risk, then by all means, yeah, let's put them. But I think it comes down to informing these patients that there is a chance. Right. And, and if it happens, the treatment, there's a treatment. Right? Totally. It's not like we're dooming these people to something, right? Because the, the incidence of capsid contracture, which is a nightmare in and of itself, is we know it's like one in 20 nationwide. You know? High. Yeah, that's a big problem. Like you got a firm, painful breast. I mean, that could ruin your ruin your month, you know? Yeah, your year. <laughs> yeah, you For could ruin your year, right? Yeah. And that's a, that's a real pal, pal, um, palpable complication that happens routinely to my patients too. I think my rate's a little bit better because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make it zero um, with a lot of the different things that I'm doing with irrigation and Keller funnel and all these different things. Um, but, um, you know, the, we don't ban implants because of that. And that's right. a, that's a real thing, you know, that can yeah. cause major problems. Well, right. The bottom line of both of these entities, the women aren't feeling good. And how are we going to make that better for them? Right. I think screening, like you said about the autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. I think being very meticulous of how you put implants in is the key. Yeah. And informed consent with that triad, we're doing the best we possibly can do. And that's what we have to do for our patients. Tell me about the responsibility of the implant manufacturers. It's Cause, interesting. Because you, <laughs> you have a little bit more of a, you have a relationship with Allergan, I, I believe. I do. Okay. Yeah. So you're, you're, you tell us, give us some insight about what the, what the implant companies are doing. There's three big implant companies in the United States, right? Yes. Um, Allergan, yeah. Mentor, and now Sientra back again. Okay. And what are the... Because, you know, it's like a lot of patients are like, oh, well, it's the implant companies. They're covering up all this stuff and they're hiding this stuff. And, you know, I know back 50 years ago that was going on and maybe even more recent. Um, I'm, I'm kind of newer in the game than you are. I mean, tell me, uh, tell me about that. What do you think? So there's a lot of misinformation on the Internet. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the issue. There's a lot of people saying, oh, there's arsenic, there's... Platinum. I read a study on platinum. I, I read this website that your name was on. You talk about <laughs> platinum being leached probably my, from... Probably my website. No, it was, it was a, <laughs> platinum being leached from implants. I'm like, whoa, sick. And let me check this out. And I, I looked up research studies on it and they found actually some women without implants had higher platinum than women with implants. And I'm like, this is totally debunked. And I was like, how are people... Why are these websites putting this crazy heavy metal toxicity stuff out there? It's like... That you know, there's no substantiation for some of these claims. You I, know. I agree with you 100%. That's yeah. the issue, right? Mm -hmm. There's hyperbole on the internet of what's going on with yep. platinum, with arsenic, with these different things, mm -hmm. and none of it's truth. 
right? So you're right. I do uh, speak for Allergan at times, mm-hmm. and I'm actually doing a study with Allergan about breast implant illness with a couple of surgeons all across the country. Yeah. Um, and so we're giving sort of uh, surveys to these patients to see what's going on. Like you were saying, do you mm-hmm. have autoimmune disease? Did you have it before? And we're tracking these symptoms and see if it's getting better. Mm. Patty McGuire is actually doing a study on patients doing a total capsulectomy versus doing only a partial capsulectomy and mm-hmm. seeing how the patients fare afterwards. But taking the implant out? Yes. Okay. And see if the capsule has anything to do with it. Okay. Um, you know, I think all of it's going to mesh together. Capsular contracture, we think, may be a bacterial biofilm, right? Mm. There may be something to that with breast implant illness, Mm -hmm. and as well as giving patients antibiotics and screwing up their digestive, you know, bio. Yeah, gut flora. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's all related. We just don't have the pieces of putting them all together. Yeah. And I think that's where the research needs to be done. So Allergan is actually actively looking into this. And I commend them for that. Yeah. Right. Because they want to get on the forefront. Because like mm-hmm. you said, most women that have breast implant illness or textured implants distrust the implant manufacturers yeah. wholeheartedly. Yeah. So now they're trying to get out in front of it and be like, listen, we're going to do a study. We're going to try to find mm-hmm. what's really going on. They've mm-hmm. been reaching out to the people on the breast implant illness website to talk to them so they mm-hmm. can sort of do a collaboration with everybody. Because I think... I mean, I'm naive because I, I always look at the good in people. I think everyone in general doesn't want to do something that's hurting somebody else. Right. No, I certainly don't. And and that's one of the reasons why I love breast augmentation is because one of those low risk operations, you know, you the, um, for a Brazilian butt lift, which is a fat transfer to buttocks, the, the death rate is like one in 3,000. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It's the yeah. highest rate in plastic surgery. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's just like I hesitate to do that. Now we have guidelines that kind of help us with where we eject the fat and stuff like that. It's hopefully going to reduce that. Um, but that's one of the risks. I uh, One of the reasons why I like breast augmentation is because everybody's happy, very, very low risk. And um, I think what you're doing is great where we can kind of further understand it, make that risk even lower, um, informing patients so they can make the right decisions and have access to all of the information. So I think you nailed it. I think an educated yeah. patient is a good patient. Great. Well, anything else you want to add about um, breast implant associated illness? No, I think, I think we covered it. I okay. think the surgeons that are seeing these patients just need to be empathetic. They may not believe in it, but mm-hmm. they need to be empathetic and listen to these women. It's true. It doesn't mean that their symptoms are not real. Absolutely. Um, it's They are experiencing something. Um, it may not be caused by the implants, um, but they are they're definitely experiencing something. And, you, and, you, and I learned that a long time ago that you just have to stop what your your medical school mind was is trying to tell them and just listen to them um because maybe you figure out it's something else right. um but you you have to kind of listen to patients and and hear what they're saying and and i um i you know i've i've been getting a few more people that that have had some stuff and the ones that i have taken out and they've done better i feel great about um, but then I will say, you know, the majority of my patients that get the, the implants, even five, six years out, they're super happy. No right. problems. You know? So if you look at, say, how many implants are out there, let's say there's 5 million implants out there. Yeah. And say even 10% of them have breast implant associated issues, mm-hmm. right? That's 500,000 women. That's a lot of women. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So even if it's 5%, it's 250,000 women. Right. That's a significant amount of women that are reacting to this implant. Do you have um, any additional resources that women can kind of, or uh, people that have implants that can kind of well, you know, so, look I mean, into? Or? I think there's a, a website, Healing Breast Implant Illness, yeah. on Facebook. There's a mm-hmm. group, um, which is good. There's also mm-hmm. Breast Implant Illness on the Instagram. Okay. Those are great resources. My Instagram has some, mm-hmm. you know, pictures and what's videos. Your, uh, what's your Instagram? Uh, Dr. Ritu Chopra. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there out. are, my website has things on breast implant illness. It's just, you need to make sure your information you're getting is vetted, like you were talking about. Yeah. That's so huge. start start with the, your basis of your, your research should start with going to a board certified plastic surgeon. I think that's important. And then next, somebody who does breast surgery, right? I think those two, you hit it on the head yeah. because you want to go to someone who can do the operation if you need the operation. Yeah. Great. 
Well, Dr. Chopra, thank you um, for coming on to the uh, podcast today. You're you're truly amazing. You have you really you enlightened me a lot on on this, and I think the viewers are really uh, really going to appreciate uh, all the extra advice that you put out there for them. Great, so. thank you for having me. All right, pleasure. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, man. All right.